Hi kids, it's Pastor Tony. And I'm sitting here in front of this rug again. Do you remember what the rug was? Check it out, here's a picture. It's this beautiful world with children from several different countries around the world walking on the globe. And around those children on either side, you can see many languages saying the same word, welcome. I'm in front of the rug because we're talking for the third lesson about how God is a linguist. A linguist is an individual who studies languages, who can read languages, write languages. They can sometimes speak and understand many languages. We said God is a linguist, and in lesson number one, we said God is a linguist because God created the languages. Remember this picture? Nimrod the king. He kept all the people on the earth in one area, even though God told them to spread out throughout the planet. And in that one area, an area called Babel, the people built a huge tower to try to reach to heaven and to prove that they were great and amazing. God, during that building, came to the people and he confused their languages. He confused them because everyone at that time was speaking one language and God created every other language. So now the people couldn't understand one another. Some of the people could understand each other and they found groups that spoke the same language and then those groups left that area and spread across the planet. That's when God created languages. In lesson two, we said that God controlled the languages. We read about that story in Acts chapter two. You see the picture of Peter, the other disciples, many followers of Jesus praying in a room. And as they prayed, the rushing wind, the sound of a rushing wind came through that room. And atop their heads, there were what looked like flaming tongues, tongues of fire. Peter and the others went outside where we're told in the city of Jerusalem, people from many different regions and countries who spoke several different languages had gathered for that day. Peter began to speak in his own language and people in every other language understood him in the way they normally talk, not Peter's language. They heard him speaking their language even though he was speaking his. On that day, God controlled the languages and the church was born. And 3,000, more than 3,000 people confessed that Jesus is Lord. He is the one who must forgive us of our sins. And they were baptized to prove or as evidence that they had become Christians. So we learn that God created the languages. God controlled the languages. And today I want to talk about how God will converge or God does converge the languages. Do you know what the word converge means? It's not a word we use often, but I think if we play this game, it might help you understand what we're talking about. I'm going to show you a sign, a sign you would probably see if you were riding in the car with mom and dad. Now, I understand many of you don't drive yet, but you've probably seen these signs and there's a good possibility you know what they mean. So I'll show you the sign and you tell me, or at least say out loud to the people in the room with you, what you think that sign means. Like this sign, as an example. What is this sign supposed to help people know that they should do? That red sign, several sides outlined in white with the big white letters that say, you're right, stop. It helps you know that you need to stop at this spot before you keep driving. Here's another sign. You probably see this in a construction area. It's orange to help get your attention. And there's a man with either a funny hand or something in his hand to let you know what's about to happen. This is a flagger sign to let you know that there's somebody up ahead with a flag who's going to direct traffic to tell you what to do in this construction area. Super important sign. How about this next sign? There it is, a square sign with the letter P and a circle in red crossing out the letter P to tell you in this spot, you should not what? You shouldn't park. Now, there was a time when I was in Philadelphia, I had a truck for work. I parked exactly in one of these spots that says I shouldn't park there. I ended up getting a $300 fine. I'll tell you more about that story another time because it really doesn't have to do with what we're doing right now. Let's go on to our next picture. What does this picture mean? Here's another question. Which leg is in the front of that person? Is it the right leg or is it the left leg? This is the sign to help us know that in this area we're coming up to, people are gonna be crossing the street. Which leg did you see in the front, the right or the left? Or did you see both? Here's our last sign. What is it? What is this sign? It's that arrow with a line through it 
to tell you not to turn around, to do a U-turn in this place. Now, just a second ago, I said it was our last sign. I was mistaken. Look at these three signs. They all mean the same thing, but they're saying it a different way. The first sign, there's a main road with another road joining. The second sign, there's two roads coming together. And the third sign, there's three roads coming together. What do they mean? This is what they mean. That there is merging traffic. That from several different areas, cars are going to be coming into this same spot. They're merging or coming together. That's what the word converge means. To take multiple things and bring them together in one same spot. Now sometimes when cars converge, it doesn't turn out so good. Look at this picture. Here in the middle of this city, all these cars are converging at the same time at this intersection. That is a bad result of all these cars reaching that spot at the same time. Even this next picture, here these cars are going around about and they're all coming together at the same time. Imagine if you had to go through something like that every single day to get to school. That would not be fun. So sometimes when things converge, it's not an enjoyable experience. But sometimes when they converge, something beautiful happens. Look at these colors. Look at the way the design of these colors make it appear that they are all coming together to the white in the center. That is beautiful, the way that this was designed. The way that everything is coming together in the future. God is going to make something beautiful when he converges all the languages together. God is the linguist who created the languages, controls them, will one day converge the language. And I want to talk to you about that, but in order to talk about this story, we need to go all the way back to the very beginning. I mean, the beginning, like Adam and Eve. We're going to watch a short little video clip that talks about Adam and Eve, the sin that they committed, because through one man's sin came into the world. Then it's going to talk about Jesus and how through one man salvation came into the world. So there's some differences and some parts that are the same between Adam and Eve and Jesus. Watch this clip as we begin to talk about how God converges the languages. Many, many years ago, one act of disobedience brought the curse of sin and death upon all mankind. And with that curse came great sorrow, grief, confusion, sickness, pain, anxiety, and fear. But through the sacrifice of one perfect man, our Messiah, sin's curse was broken. And with his death and resurrection came the promise that one day the effects of the curse would be completely gone. It was on the bleak and gloomy island of Patmos that God revealed a glimpse of the glories of heaven to his deeply loved apostle, John. It was on this island, drenched in darkness and the horrors of persecution and loneliness, that John was encouraged with the promise of a much better place. That clip gave us a brief explanation of where salvation comes from. It comes from Jesus, his death on the cross, his resurrection and return to heaven. It also introduced to us why we have the need to be saved, because we're sinners who have disobeyed God. We can only join God in heaven if we ask him to forgive us of our sins. It also introduced us to a man named John. John was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He was one of Jesus' closest friends who spent every day with Jesus while he was in his ministry for those three years. But after Jesus was gone, had returned to heaven, John was convicted of being a follower of God. And he was sentenced to be isolated away from others on the island of Patmos. Now, many of us during 2020, we've experienced a form of isolation where we can't be around our friends. Some of us have decided or been told that we can't be around family. Can you imagine though, if that isolation didn't continue for months, but you were told it would last for the rest of your life? That's what John was experiencing. And although he was isolated and separated from friends and family and those that he loved, God never left him. In fact, God came to John and God gave John visions of what the future would look like for our planet, for those who live on earth, and even what heaven would look like when God sets up his kingdom. Let's watch this next clip to see some of what John saw. Heaven is a real place where Jesus lives, and in his presence is great joy and pleasure forevermore. 
God's glory is unveiled and visible. It is a place where we enjoy face-to-face -face friendship with Him. There are no tears because there is no death, pain, or sorrow. There are no broken relationships and no broken hearts. All who are His are new and incapable of hurting or being hurt. The great city of our God, the New Jerusalem, shines in spectacular glory. A crystal clear river flows from the Messiah's throne down through the city, and those who drink of it will never thirst again. Also, in the midst of this new paradise stands the tree of life. The tree that mankind had once been forever banished from approaching is now placed out in the open to be freely eaten from. It is filled with fruit, and because it feeds off the river of life, its leaves will never fade away. It is eternal, like everything else in this new and wonderful place where Jesus lives. The sun and the moon no longer light the earth because they are no longer needed. The brightness of the Savior's glory illuminates the great city, which is built with gold, precious stones, and pearls, and His light sends prisms of color out over the expanse of His kingdom. It is the same city that multitudes of God's people throughout all history have longed for, a city with eternal foundations whose architect and builder is God Himself. Everything just explained in that video comes from the Bible. You see, John, when he had those visions, decided to write down what he had seen, to record for us what God was showing him. And he recorded that information in the book of Revelation, where he said, in heaven, there are streets made of gold. There is a throne where God sits and a river that comes from that throne that spreads throughout heaven. And there is a tree along that river, the tree of life that will supply food to those who are there. Again, streets of gold, walls of crystals, of precious stones. There's no night, no crying, no pain, no suffering, no death. And he said there's no source of light like we would think a source of light, like the sun or the stars or the moon. Instead, in this picture, you see the source of light is God. At the center of heaven is God. That's the best part about heaven, that God will be there, and we who are there in heaven can be with Him. This is the place that so many believers have been waiting to enter. Believers from every time, every country around this world, who speak every single language, and the Bible says that one day they will gather together around God, and they, at one time, will worship God. What language do you think they'll speak? Will it be one language, the one that existed before the Tower of Babel? Will it be a new language? Or will it be every single language that has ever been spoken all at the same time? Now that might be confusing for us, but for God that would not be confusing. Because God created the languages, which means He can control them. And when He converges them together, God will be able to understand what's being said. Look at what the Bible says about these languages coming together. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue, every language, shall confess to God. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says that no matter what language you speak, one day when God is seen in heaven, every language will confess that Jesus, He is God, and He is the one that deserves worship. I would love to talk to you more about heaven, and I'll probably do that in another lesson, but for now I want to talk with you about how you can know for sure that you will be in heaven one day, that you will be there to see God converge all the languages. So watch this next clip. You'll see Jesus standing outside of a door, knocking, saying, please let me in. Let me become part of your close group, part of your life. Watch this clip, and then we'll talk just a little bit more. Open your eyes, your ears, and your heart. Behold Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. He is the King. Follow Him into His kingdom. Be willing to give up everything to obtain something far greater. The treasures of heaven that cannot be destroyed, cannot disappoint, and cannot be stolen. Yes, I am coming quickly, Jesus says. 
and all those who are his respond, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Did you see him? Did you see Jesus knocking? Jesus said to his followers, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you will let me in, I will come in and I will fellowship, spend time with you, and you will be able to spend time with me. What he meant is, I want to be part of your life. I want to come into your life so that you and I can become close, that we can become family and spend forever together. How do we do that? How do we let Jesus into our life so that we can be family, so that we can know for sure we're on our way to heaven? The Bible says that we must admit that we are sinners. Come to a point in our life where we say to God, I was wrong. I broke your standard. We have to admit that we are sinners. And we have to believe that Jesus died on the cross as the payment for our sins. All have sinned. The punishment for sin is death. We have to believe that Jesus died on the cross to take our punishment, to take death in our place. And then we have to call out to God to say, I am sorry. I am sorry I am a sinner. I have done wrong. Will you please forgive me? And the moment we do that, the Bible says that that's like us opening the door and saying, Jesus, please come into my life so that we can fellowship together, so that we can be family. One day, all of those of us who are family with God, who are Christians, who have been saved, will be together in heaven. When God converges the languages, the ones He created, the ones He controlled, when He brings them together, to become part of God's family, we can admit, believe, and call in any language because God understands them all. I know for sure that I will be in heaven, and I hope that I'll be able to see you there too. And until then, I encourage you, continue to learn more about who God is so that the more you know about who He is, the more you know how you can be like Him. That's what we should be doing as followers of God. We've reached the end of our series on God is a Linguist. I hope that it's been encouraging for you, that you've understood more about who God is and what He does. And I hope that today you have a great day. Bye.